Well, thank you very much indeed for um, the warm introduction. Thank you, everybody who's here. It's great to be back at Slush. This uh, event has changed. I was last year speaking in 2019, and um, for reasons that I'll explain later, Helsinki in Finland is very close to my heart when it comes not only to the business that I've got, but also to quantum generally. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit um, about the context of starting a business, but I'm going to speak more about the way in which these things have to be funded, where there's an alignment of interest between the capital that you have and the business that you're running. My business has raised a billion and a half dollars, and we do not have a penny from venture capital. That's neither a judgment nor a commitment to you to say that you should or should not have venture capital. It is simply a statement of fact. And it's not that I funded it either, or that one individual funded it. We have a diverse source of funders. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a little bit of a walk through where we came from, where we are now, and where we're going. And I'll start by saying that we are right now the um, I think the largest and the leading um, technology company um, in the quantum sector. And I think by some significant margin. Now, I am um, going to give a quick brief um, introduction to myself and the business, and then I'll swing into the main context and the content of this presentation. Ten years ago, I was 52 years old. Uh, I'm now 62. And I founded a company. It was my second startup. My first startup was when I was considerably younger. In fact, my first investor was Masayoshi Son in 1997. SoftBank was just getting started. And it was a business that I had founded in Hong Kong. And it was a tech company. I had retired. I had gone back to Cambridge. I was the founder of something called Accelerate Cambridge which today is probably the leading deep tech accelerator program outside of the United States. And it's com comparable really to what's happening at MIT and Stanford. That was founded for the university. I was also the chairman of the Stephen Hawking Foundation. And it was something that Stephen said, which was the inspiration for founding Cambridge Quantum, which was the name of the entity that we started way back then. And the issue for us was that nobody really understood quantum. There certainly wasn't a business case to be made. But at the same time, there was this conviction that quantum was not merely another disruptive technology. The conviction was and is that this is an industrial revolution. This is something which affects all societies in all walks of life. It was very difficult at that time to find a way to align capital with the business that was unlikely to have any meaningful revenue for many, many years. In fact, it was only this year, 10 years after the business was started, that we had meaningful revenue. So this is a challenge, and it's not an easy one to navigate, but it is one that can be navigated. Just this year, some of you who follow Continuum may know, and those of you who do not may know, that we were valued. In fact, this is slightly out of date. In the secondary, our shares are trading at about $14 billion. And that is a reflection of the fact that quantum computing is now seen worldwide by many organizations, many governments, and many large companies as fundamental to their future. In fact, AI and the future of AI, which I'll talk about in a moment, depends, critically depends, upon the success of quantum computers. And this is not something which is now speculative. This is something which is accepted, and the mainstream for this acceptance is widespread. I'm now going to take a little bit of a, a, a step back, and I'm going to talk about the key foundations that allow for that journey to have happened. It's very easy to go back to something 10 years ago that was worth nothing to something today that might be worth a lot. It doesn't matter whether the lot can be measured in XYZ number of dollars. 
What also matters is the lives that we've changed, the people who work for us, and the fact that we can do things differently. We don't have to have a misalignment of interest with what we want to do, and what we have to do, and what we can do. And the fundamental issue here is that we do not, and have not, and will not give capital a priority over people. And this is essential in deep tech and deep science. This is not just another app. It's much more important. And so you cannot have a situation, in my view, where the provider of capital is giving an increasing incentive for himself or themselves to do well at a cost of the people. Even today, after raising almost $2 billion, we today have almost 40% of the company owned by the people that work there. So look at these pillars. I'm going to ask you to just bear in mind one comment that Stephen made, Professor Hawking, back in 2014. Quantum computing will change everything, even biology. I'd like you to just consider that for a second. If the 19th century was the century for engineering and mechanics and physics, you know, we started looking at things that, um, coming into the 20th century, things such as steam engines and then obviously computers and telephones and then later on everything that's connected with the internet. The 21st century is going to be the century of biology. The most complex systems that we have are not systems which are physics or chemistry. They are biology. We don't even understand our brain, never mind anything else. What would happen if humanity could live longer and with dignity, that the age of 100 were not crumbling? This is the promise of a better biological system. Nothing could be bigger. Literally, there is no market bigger. And you don't need me to tell you this. Just look across the border in Denmark at Novo Nordisk. Look at the valuation of the company because of its impact on weight reduction, fat reduction, and the production of insulin. It's a tiny sliver of what biology means. So this was the inspiration that led to the founding of our company. And so therefore, one pillar is scientific backing. Now, another pillar is market validation. This number is accretive. There are many, many research organizations and consulting companies, such as McKinsey and Bain, and they've come up with numbers which are probably even a little bit bigger. So it's not just that you have to have a scientific foundation, you have to have some sort of validation, and you have to have something which can enumerate that validation. In this case, it's an addressable market. Well, then, of course, you have to have the people, and you have to have the culture. I'm not telling you anything that you don't know. But perhaps what might be insightful here is that managing people like this, we have about 400, in fact, over 400 PhDs, is not the same as managing somebody who is developing an app because they want to be 20% better than somebody else. This is not to say that that is not important. That is important as well. Remember I said that we do not allow capital to take a preferential role over people. This is consistent. At any given time when we have had choice, our choice is to back our people. And that is one of the pillars. Well, of course, then smart capital. I'm going to come back to this in a moment. And then you need time. Things don't happen overnight, although if they do happen overnight in science, then quite often they're not science. This is an area where there are hundreds, if not thousands, of people who know more than I ever will about quantum. This is not something where I can pretend or indeed know something more than anybody else. So this is something which is critical in deep science the validation of the market, the validation of the idea, and then a global culture where things can be tested. Now, I said earlier this is going to be an industrial revolution, and I'm just going to skip a slide and go to this next slide. 
I wonder how many of you actually understand or have appreciated this. Not since 1945 has there been a single technology where every nation state of consequence has a national program. This has never happened before. And these programs are multi-year programs. The Singapore program, it's not mentioned up there, started in 2008. The Chinese program started shortly thereafter. They're on their fourth five-year plan. The UK program started in 2013. Every nation state of consequence has a quantum technologies program. And the US program is far bigger than the numbers there because now both IARPA and DARPA and the individual states are reined into a congressional bill. One of the reasons is that the United States was behind. When's the last time that anything of consequence was not backed by Silicon Valley? Well, here you have it. In quantum technologies, some of the more, most impactful technologies and technology providers are not and have not been in the US. Now, I'm an Anglo-American company, and we have a big base in the US, and I can tell you that they're, if not catching up, have caught up. When anybody asks me, who are the most serious competitors other than my own company, and we are years ahead of the competition right now, I say two names. One of them is Google. I truly believe that Google is a serious competitor, their quantum program. But who's the other one? It's a Finnish company. It's a Finnish company called IQM. It's a company in which I happen also to be deeply associated with the founders and the University of Alto. So here is an example of where this audience, if you are predominantly Finnish, are sitting on something that will eventually potential, uh, have the potential to compare with what today we talk about in AI, for example, OpenAI or Cohere, or there's so many, Anthropic, et cetera, et cetera. So this is something which is very, very interesting. This is not just a West Coast US phenomenon. Now, it could well be that capital and the strength of innovation and the way in which the regulatory framework comes together will mean that other American organizations, in addition to mine, will be leaders. But right now, the race is wide open. I'm going to switch back to um, this idea that you can find, that it is possible to find capital that is aligned with your objectives. And what I mean by this is people that know more than you do about why they will be using that technology. So just a shade under $2 billion invested in uh, my company in hard cash terms that we can audit. It's, uh, as I said earlier, one and a half billion have raised. There was some uh, capital invested earlier, which I'll explain in a second. But if you look at that slide, you see that there um, are two companies that were merged. One company is Cambridge Quantum, which I founded in 2014. And a year later, a large American organization, an aerospace and defense company called Honeywell, unbeknownst to me at the time, was starting their own in-house quantum technologies program to build a quantum computer. My early investor was GSR Corporation. GSR is a Japanese company. It's the most important supply chain provider, for example, to Intel. They were a customer and then they became a shareholder. Both IBM and Honeywell invested in my company and they were customers first and then they became investors. And if you see on the right hand side, my other investors are Mitsui and Amgen and JP Morgan, not from their funds. This is not funds that they manage for their customers. This is JP Morgan from their balance sheet. And I'm told that this is the largest investment they've made from their balance sheet, other than in acquiring another bank. In each case, in each of those cases, these people, and I'm just highlighting them now, were customers before they became investors. They do have venture arms, but they did not invest on the basis of venture capital. We have other customers and partners which are highlighted there. And the reason I'm just highlighting this particular slide is that we today are on the cusp, in fact, have crossed the tipping point of where quantum is becoming commercial. And now I'm going to go back to the reason why that is the case. 
I have two minutes, and I would ask you if you remember nothing else from this conversation, then perhaps you might remember this in a year or two's time. Stephen Hawking said that quantum computing will affect biology. Biology is us, the people we love, the people we care for, everybody in our ecosystem, everybody in our street, in our neighborhood. Biology is the system by which we survive and prosper. If biology is wrong, we're wrong. And remember, biological systems also affect the, the climate and the planet. Now, this diagram at the top explains how something that was not anticipated by me will affect everybody on the planet, and that is generative AI. But Gen AI on its own cannot do this. So a combination of a quantum computer that cannot be simulated, powerful Gen AI, and the right algorithms and the data at the start will allow us to do things that we previously have not been able to do. It is entirely likely that oncologies and all the other diseases related to aging will be resolved through this combination that have not yet been capable of being resolved. This is not about data analysis. This is not about looking for patterns in data. This is about DNA editing. This is about RNA sequencing. This is going right back to the early stages of what life means. This system will be in place in the first quarter of 2025, not 2030 or 2050. Our partners here are the government of Singapore. We also have a similar project with Amgen, and we also have a similar project in the United Kingdom. Up in Edinburgh, for those of you who know about genetics, that was where Dolly the Lamb came from. So I'm now in my last um, few seconds, and I'm going to finish by pulling this slide up. This is a slide from the Sanger Institute. And all I would remind you is that nothing is more important than this. We may get excited about sport and other things. We may be excited about fintech. Of course, we should be excited about language processing. But biology is where it all comes together. It's been a pleasure to speak to you. And I'm now out of time. And so I'm going to say goodbye to you and good luck. And it's such a pleasure to be back uh, here in Helsinki and at Slush. Thank you. <laughs>